Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. On the chair is Doberman specialist, Mr. Jeffrey Lynn Brucker. I remember watching Jeffrey's show dogs when I was a youngster in Canada, and it, it was always amazing. So sit back and enjoy and listen to what Jeffrey has to say for an hour or so. Hi, everybody. Today on the interview chair, I have longtime friend, Mr. Jeff Brucker. How are you, Jeff? Doing fine. Doing As fine. usual. <laughs> it's good to see you. You've been a long time. Yeah, we've both gotten a little older. Oh, yeah. You got you got older than I did, though. I've just, okay, well, you, oh, yeah. you pretty well stay the same. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah, I've always looked old. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so have you, been, have you been showing much? I know you were just at, at the Doberman Nationals. Yes. Uh, well, I think I had about six dogs there, which at the National with Big Rings is plenty for me. Oh, for sure. And um, at some of our breeding ones, so that was good. And didn't I hear, didn't you judge the top 20 or something like that? Yeah, they had uh, two top 20s because of the COVID year, and I judged the second one that they had. Oh, good. How, how'd that go? Was that fun? Yeah, it was fun because it was totally different format. Um, the the format that they generally use uh, when you first come in the ring, you give a uh, a number between one and ten for the general overall appearance of the dog, and then you have a list of things that basically quote the old uh, the old standard points that they had in the AKC book, uh, and you each category you grade them in that category. The problem with this is the only time the overall picture comes into play is if there's a tie, mm. which I think is asinine. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it should be that you look at them. Well, if I think this is only a four or a five, then you mark all the pieces and it comes out to be a fairly high number. It doesn't really matter because it's only multiplied by four or five, because a lot of times you'll have a dog that has a lot of nice pieces on it, but they don't go on that dog. You know, and so you don't give it a high rating, but it was it was fun. They did more of an overall rating on the dogs. Um, some of the judges thought that uh, the dogs were just unbelievably great, and they gave them out of a hundred. Uh, I think one said ninety four or ninety six or something. Uh, I I've always thought if I give a ninety six to a dog, it ought to be able to drive the van. Uh, you know, I, I don't see any of those. If I give you a 96, what do you do when the next dog comes in and it's better than the one you just gave a 96? Yeah. You, a 90, you know, <laughs> we're two points off of perfect, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got, we got sloping backs, tails that come up over their back that if they were long, they could scratch their head with. And it's supposed to be a heavy bone breed and they're barely making medium. And they got a 96 out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well. <laughs> well yeah. it sounds like it was fun anyway. So. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to start off. The first question is, Jeffrey, how did you get started in the sport of dogs and how old were you when it, when this all occurred? I Close to 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was in show business. Uh, she used to work with a fellow called Larry Storch, a comedian. He was on F Troop, for those of you that remember F Troop. Uh, anyway, uh, so a, another woman raised me. I called her my aunt uh, and a fairly strict woman, but she gave up a home in Chicago uh, where she uh, housed uh, show business kids. And when my mother got the job in New York with Larry Storch, she moved with just me. My mother had no money paid for everything. And um, she insisted on certain things like no cursing in the house. And uh, you ate all of your food. And if you didn't want to eat your dinner, it's okay. You could have for breakfast or lunch the next day, or maybe the next evening's dinner. But as long as she was putting a roof over my head, I was eating all the food I was presented. And that was not a problem. <laughs> So, so anyway, yeah, going, carrying on, uh, she wanted to have, because I was getting older and was out more, uh, she wanted to have a dog that would protect her. And uh, so she wanted a German Shepherd. 
So I got out the, I don't remember if it was the news or the mirror, and they had a list of dog sales. And I called the shepherd people, and either they didn't answer or they didn't have any dogs at the time. The next ad I saw was a Doberman ad. So I said, let me give these people a call. The very first person I called answered the call, invited me out to the house, and uh, I bought a Doberman. And two weeks later, I bought another Doberman. And um, it went on from there. They are, their names were the Bushmans, and they had alum map kennels. And for the Doberman people out there, it was basically skipper breeding. And the next uh, significant thing that happened to me in dogs was uh, I went to the Connecticut, New York, uh, Doberman Pincher Club specialty, and they had a junior showmanship competition. <laughs> And there was one person specifically that would win this every year. And it was quite a, an attended event. And uh, the, it was my first time in junior showmanship. And I said, uh, I don't want to wear out this mail that I have that I'm going to be showing later by taking him through juniors. So I walked around to the crowd and asked if anyone would let me have a dog for juniors. And uh, they did. And uh, when the judging was over, this person that wins every year uh, had to skip a year because uh, I won and he went second. And the judge said to both of us, you have a dog you show every weekend. And this fellow went around and found some dog he'd never seen before. So I gave that a lot of credit. Uh, from there, I went to. Um, First of all, who was the person who was the, who, who went second? Who was that? You know, I, I purposely skipped over that. I know but it was it was Bobby Stebbins. <laughs> That's okay. But anyway, anyway, Bobby, that was fun. <laughs> uh, you know, he's passed away, and I don't like to say anything that may uh, be interpreted as, as uh, disparaging. I'm oh, trying to move. Oh. I'm trying to move outside because the dogs are joining in the conversation. Oh, that was fine. So it's, it's all about dogs anyway. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, the next time I know about two times later, I went into junior showmanship and um, I, I, I think I got third or something. And the next weekend, uh, I showed my dog and beat the handler that had judged the uh, juniors. And I said, well, OK, uh, I don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> and then I learned uh, what I know about handling from basically from three people. Uh, Peter Noop, that handled Storm in the Garden and won it twice. Monroe Stebbins, uh, who I think was one of the best mechanics as far as setting up a dog. And Jane Kay, who uh, basically taught me how to move a dog. So it, uh, those were the, I was lucky enough to have those three people. I don't think Pete Noop ever knew that I tried to copy what he did, but he was so natural in the ring. I was watching these other people working so hard in setting up their dog and trying to convince the judge who was the best chiropractor in there. Uh, and then here's Pete Noop picking a leaf off a tree and having the dog follow it coming down. And I said, I need to learn how to do that. <laughs> so I'm a combination of people and handling. Uh, as far as looking at dogs uh, and evaluating dogs, I would say that that would have to be between uh, Melbourne Downing uh, for the mechanical side, and Alva Rosenberg for the artist side. And uh, I was lucky enough to live with easy walking distance from where Alva had his antique shop in New York. Wow, that'd be excellent. That'd be amazing. And, and because of that, I have a fairly decent uh, porcelain collection. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting. Uh, one story about Alva uh, is that uh, a handler that we both knew and a nice person uh, came up when I was taking the picture of going winner's dog. And he said to Alma and myself, he says, I rarely ask this, but I need to know because I, I really like you, Alva. And he's I like you too, Jeff. And he said to Alva, why did you put Jeff's dog that was cowhocked over my dog who was not cowhocked? And Alva looked at him and says, I never got that far. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just never got that far. And I thought, what a what a good answer to have. That is a great answer. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, go ahead. What are the other things you no, like I want to, to keep going? Why don't you keep going? What from there? You so you learn from um, Peter how to be a natural handler uh, from from uh, Monroe Stebbins from Steb. What did you What did you learn from Steb? He's you see his mechanics. Right. Well, and and placing did you, your dog. Did you work for anybody, Jeffrey? No. no. Uh, the uh, the getting back to Steb for a minute, Stebbins. Um, he was able to manipulate a dog and setting it up that would give it more forechest, which it still applies today. The people put their feet too far forward and it sucks the forechest up. And he would be able to bend the stifle to make a little more angulation. And I was impressed with the way he was able to manipulate the dog to looking like a much better dog than I thought. <coughs> but, um, uh, you know, you, I just think you have to have all of these things to do because you have the judges, uh, for, such as myself, uh, I don't judge at AKC shows except for top 20s. And I've done that for, I don't know, eight or nine clubs. And um, you, have to, you have to know how to do that in order to, and then you know how to, for the judges that want freestanding, as I do when I'm judging, uh, I don't let them set the dogs up at all. <laughs> and I tell them right off the bat, I'm not just being best chiropractor. You know, if you do that, you walk in the ring and you look around the ring with these dogs all prodded and placed and whatnot. And you say, okay, well, I like the first one and the third one and the sixth one. Then they go around the ring, you're back to square one because they all fell apart. So I just let them stand out on their own. They can study them for examination. But other than that, I have no interest in seeing if they can twist the rear enough so it's not cowhocked anymore and all that. And then I look at it and say, well, that dog doesn't look cowhocked. Then it moves and it's cowhocked. Now I know what happened. <laughs> they twist. Uh, let's see. Other things I might tell you that somebody out there might find interesting. Um, I've shown most of the recognized breeds before the AKC opened the floodgates. Uh, but, uh, and I've won with a whole lot of dogs. I've had some great clients. I've met some very significant people. Um, and aside from doing dogs, uh, I consider it significant. I sang at the Met Pond Opera House for about three years in the boys chorus. And also the little church around the corner which some of the New Yorkers, if they follow this, will know what it is. It was the Actors Church. And the Actors Church, which was, was Episcopalian, had almost the entire boys' chorus from the Mets Ball and Opera House singing there. And wow. they actually paid better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry. So, let, you, you were how old when you went on your own as a handler? Well, that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, the I couldn't get my handler's license till I was 21. Mm -hmm. uh, when I applied for a handler's license, uh, I was uh, turned down the first time uh, because supposedly because I didn't have a kennel, even though I knew fully well of at least three handlers that worked out of their garage. So I went up to Syracuse and... Uh, built a kennel with another fellow, Gary Town, a Basin Hound guy. And uh, I was decided that I wasn't going to apply for my license because uh, the AKC would have one reason or another not to give it to me. Uh, so I decided I was going to show up in Canada, which I did for many years, uh, past president of the Dope and Pinscher Club of Canada. Uh, and I've traveled from, I've been in every province. I went from Newfoundland to British Columbia, and I took most of that trip by train from Montreal to Vancouver, and then I went to dog shows along the way and were picked up by people and had a great time. Um, it's just something I wanted to do. So then one day at a show, Kitty Drury said to me, um, why haven't you got a handler's license? And I said, because I don't want to give them the pleasure of turning me down again. In the first time I, I applied for my license, I had a Sears catalog out of winning in Canada and finishing dogs of my own here, and it wasn't good enough. So I, I said, well, whatever. They're just not going to see me here. I'm going to show up in Canada, probably eventually move to Canada, uh, and the AKC can keep it. So um, 
she said to me, uh, apply for your license again. Well, at that time, they were giving out one breed at a time. Uh, I asked her what breeds she thought I should apply for. She said, everything that you think that you can do well with. So I applied for 21 breeds, and I got 21 breeds, which was about 17 more than the people they gave the license to initially. <laughs> uh, and then after a while, I got very friendly with uh, Leonard Brumby. Uh, once he found out that I was doing educational things and dogs, uh, he really liked that. He liked a kind of a little brochure that I made up. Uh, and I think that uh, that began a very good relationship with us. But Kitty Drury was, uh, I, did you know Kitty Drury? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. She was an outstanding judge and an outstanding individual. When I lived up near Syracuse, I think she lived in Phelps, New York at that time. She called me up because she was reviewing the Newfoundland standard. And she wanted me to play devil's advocate with her. And I did. And it was quite a learning experience. And a person that even though they had done judging in many big shows was just a regular person, uh, very open to teaching you anything that she knew. In fact, she was telling me they took a trip with their daughter up to Newfoundland and uh, stayed at like a bed and breakfast. And she asked them uh, where the bathroom was. And they, see, they said, out in the barn and you have some sand and a bucket and a shovel. So it was uh, somewhat primitive. <laughs> I think things have changed there now. <laughs> now, when I got my license, first thing I did was go to a dog show to show dogs for money. And, uh, of course, being as humble as I have been, uh, I asked what Jane Camp was getting at that time, Jane Forsythe, and they said $25. I said, my handling fee is $25. Uh, the first dog that I finished was a Doberman. It cost a woman $175. And she advertised in, I guess, popular dogs at that time and took a, and had a picture with the dog's win record. And they, it was Alva Rosenberg, Louis Murr, Henry Stecker, you know, just the Melbourne Downing. It was just the rogues gallery of the top judges in the country. And then fourth in a class of four, she gave a name and said, first assignment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so for my first assignment, let me put this dog forth that every top judge in the country has put up. <laughs> so how old but were I you just, when you started doing that jeff how old were you when you got licensed oh i'd have to guess 22 they wouldn't allow to 21 i might have been 23 i don't know it depends on how long i was mad at at the akc like because i enjoyed showing in canada and had you know a lot of great friends and a lot of great times there yeah some uh, good clients out there like for some reason then you show you showed Scotty's for John Devlin. John Devlin, yeah. Right. I showed Scotty's for him. He sent me the Scotty when I was out in, I think, Calgary. And I couldn't get the bugger out of the box. Eventually I turned the box upside down and shook him out and covered him with the covers so he didn't bite me. <laughs> uh, after a while. We were good friends, but at least initially he was a little wild. I also showed for the nut beams. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, let me just think of anyone else up there. They were yes. characters for sure. I used to love showing to both of them. My God. Well, you have to imagine you go to Newfoundland and uh, Megan Nutbeam's name first was Megan Moore's and you're going to the Moore's auditorium. <laughs> so you know right away that if she's showing dogs there that uh, <laughs> she may win something, uh, but we became good friends. Um, her brother was premier of Newfoundland, Frank Morris, and he was in the federal government also. You know, I'm so used to Canada. It's, I almost feel like, well, I can talk about Canada for a while. <laughs> Go ahead. No, oh, you keep I, going. What, what else? I want you to keep going. And I'm just trying to think. That's all is significant. And good night. No. Yeah, uh, right. let's see. Well, <laughs> and this is, this is, the, this is the, what year was this, Jeffrey? What year was when you were when you were licensed? You were 23. What year was that? 
Well, let's figure it out. Uh, so that would be. years and that would be I'm trying to say well I still 71. I, I think we're 71 or 72 or something like that okay so I don't make it that. so that, so we're we're missing almost 50 years I want to know it all <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's depending on how bored everybody wants to be. Uh, I'll tell you how to get bored. I'll know. Okay. Well, I, I teach and have taught uh, seminars yep. uh, and uh, handling seminars, and I've taught them in Spanish speaking, Spanish speaking places, and I speak very little Spanish with an interpreter who I realized after a moment was ahead of where I was in the class. Uh, so we had to readjust there. Uh, I've taught them in uh, Mexico. Uh, one interesting thing with Mexico is there was a, a very nice lady by the name of Thelma Von Thad, and uh, she was president of the FCI. And she and Robin Hernandez and uh, several other people from Mexico City in the area uh, were inviting me. So I came down and I'm expecting to see this group of people like I did in Puerto Rico, you know, maybe 25 people or something. And we pull into an estate and we go into this rather large living room that has seats uh, around and then one seat in the middle. And this is going to be the handling seminar. They didn't want to have a handling seminar. They wanted to talk to me about my experience in dogs. <laughs> and when I thought about different things, um, which I considered a great honor, and they paid me just as if it was a handling seminar, but I didn't teach any of them any handling. I might have told them things that I thought uh, judges could do better as far as their procedure is concerned. Mm. Um but other than that, but it was it was significant. I enjoyed it. Uh, winning different breeds in the garden has always been good. Um, I've had some very good winning Dobermans, particularly, but also Danes and a, a strong pointer. Um, the pointer uh, is a Kirkrise pointer for pointer people, and that's an English kennel that has been behind most great dogs. They've had their end here. And uh, I went over and brought pictures of our top dogs here. I went to Crook Rise Kennels. Uh, I saw their pointers. And I, even though they knew I was coming, it wasn't more than a day in advance. And they said, who is this joker here looking at our dogs? And I was looking to buy them. And uh, they were more or less trying to cut the visit short. And I saw their daughter outside working a pointer. And I said, uh, you know, I teach this. Can I help her out at all? They said, go ahead. So I took the pointer she had and worked it for a minute and then took it around the ring without a leash on it and then set it up without the leash. And then I said, now I'm going to show you how to do that. When I went back into the house, the Kirk Rise people stayed up to three o'clock in the morning teaching me pointers and telling me where I needed to go other than where they originally thought they needed to teach me to go, tell me to go. And I drove <laughs> 1,400 miles uh, around England, England, which is only 500 miles long. So I crisscrossed it. Uh, I found um, pointers that were really nice in a, in a place called St. Aldwin's. And I bought two sisters and an uncle. Uh, the sister, when I took her to the garden at about 13 months, uh, <laughs> I noticed that one of the spotlights coming down from the ceiling was particularly bright in one area. And I thought, you know, I can go in and stop in this area. And I do. And the difference between my pointers and the ones they had here is they didn't have any dish here in the head. Well, the English considered all the dogs I showed them pictures of winning dogs here. They said, if we had one like that, the litter, we'd never breed the dog or the bitch. And we sell it to somebody as a pet and would not give them papers. I mean, they were just, <laughs> this is not a pointer. So anyway, uh, the first show that I took her to of major category uh, was the garden, and uh, Annie Rogers was judging it. And uh, I got under the spotlight. I aimed the bit straight ahead, 
I pulled her tail and got on one knee behind her. And basically that was the end of it. You know, she looked at her as if to go, ah, oh. it was all over. There, you know, no other pointers had a head like that. She went on to get 350 breeds, I think 57 first in the group and about seven best in shows. But a, a extremely nice bitch, great pet. Uh, the pointers that we had around here at that time, uh, if if they got loose, you'd never catch them. You know, they were just too skittish. The English pointers were just nice. And now we have good ones here, but most of them have dishes that do any winning. Uh, and I think some of that is because, and Bobby Fisher that you spoke about earlier, brought my bitch's father over here. What was your so, bitch's name? St. Alwyn's Radiance. Radiance. We had a and dog her, up here. You remember, you remember John McNichol? No. Up here, the hand out John McNichol. He showed St. Alwyn's Traveler, which is a dog oh, okay. in the Navy. Okay. He, was, he was top sporting dog, I think, up here for a little time. So, yeah. Well, the and, sister and name right away. The sister of this bitch was St. Alwyn's Remembrance. And I won the group one day, one weekend with Ray and then went someplace else on the same judge and one with the sister, and they were different colors. <laughs> you know, that, but that always, that's kind of an interesting point in itself. Uh, I don't know if you ever remember, I had a Saluki. And uh, it was, Merlin was his call name, uh, he was a really good Saluki. He looked like he'd been painted. He was black with these white fringes, white tail fringes, everything just beautiful on the dog. And uh, I took him to the garden. And the judge at the garden gave him best of breed. Well, everyone there was saying, oh, well, you know, uh, it was an accident. You know, how did this dog get this? But next year, we have the Hound Authority that's coming in there. And this woman is, you know, wonderful. So I get to the garden, and I'm the first dog in line. She looked at my dog and glanced around the rest of the dogs. It was all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things, I know I've skipped around a little bit, but one of the things that, People out there that are judges that are, and I don't know, do you have a group that are judges that are watching this? Oh, yeah. Everybody watches this, Jeffrey. You just okay. wait. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that I see judges do that I think is, is not really to the benefit of finding the best dog, because actually judging, you're, you're endorsing dogs for breeding. So what I see them doing is they'll move a dog and then when they get finished moving the dog, I have to go around the rings at the end of the line. And they not only look at that dog when it gets to the end of the line, but they scan down all the other dogs that have been moved. This makes everyone in the ring come to attention and show their dog or what I call burning up their dog. Whereas during that time that the judge is really not supposed to be doing that, they're supposed to be watching the next dog move, it's wiping those dogs out, and the people don't can't go back and refresh themselves or refresh the dog or play with the dog or something like that. So I always wonder, you know, why why judges do that? Uh, I don't know. It, you know, I could almost understand if they were doing it and then selecting dogs and putting them on the other side for further consideration or something. But when they do it, and it's <coughs> you know, they're it's like their final judging is happening right now. And they still have four more dogs to move. So I, you know, I question that. The other thing is this, uh, this thing with teeth, with counting teeth. Uh, I felt a long time ago that the American Kennel Club should put together something so you can have the teeth certified. <laughs> you know, have a veterinarian, a longtime breeder, whoever you want, have a tribunal, but have them certified. You can either have your dog set teeth certified or not, but in the judging program, it would have certified next to it. So he doesn't need to go in your dog's mouth because you're trying to, Rottweiler can only have two missing teeth, it's qualified. You're opening a mouth of a dog that has maybe 2,500 pounds of pressure in it. You're a stranger, the dog's a guard dog, and you have to look through the slobber to count all the teeth. Nobody is doing that. Right. <laughs> You have no idea if this dog's missing teeth or not. 
have the teeth certified. And you also don't have to endanger the lives of the judges. <laughs> I'm surprised at how many shows I go to that some dog hasn't attacked another dog or attacked a judge. You know, they're, they're strangers, and I know the dog should tolerate it, but, but sometimes there's a lot going on. There's hair dryers, there's things being slammed down. You've got a lot of distractions there, and you have a dog that is companion and guard, mm -hmm. not companion or guard, companion and guard. And you've got to count on this dog being a really good companion now because it's a stranger coming up there to open up his mouth and look into his teeth. And then if that's not enough, he's going to grab his testicles. You know, <laughs> great, 100%. Well, I don't know. I, I think that, that that would be something that's maybe a pipe dream, but who knows? And maybe somebody else will suggest it to the AKC and they'll look into it. But particularly with dogs that have a disqualification in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Get them certified, period. You don't that's, have to worry uh, about it. Exactly. I, I, I think that that sounds like an interesting idea, actually. So, Because then it's just said and done. They can look down their list and see a, a check mark meaning it's certified, and away they go. Yeah. I had one judge at a show that I had a Rottweiler that was a Schutzen 3, an international police dog 3, uh, and probably the smartest dog I've ever been around. In fact, he went best in show in Bucks County two years in a row. Uh, but this very big judge, big being in stature, um, he was just a great big man. And he's coming down the line examining the teeth on the Rottweilers himself. Well, <laughs> this dog is not going to have him open the mouth and examine the teeth. The dog will bite him. That's all there is to it. So when he gets up to me, uh, I start showing him the teeth, and he says, I examine the teeth myself. And I said, sir, this dog will bite you. Let me show you the teeth. I will examine them myself. I said, okay, well, I'm leaving now. And he said, you can't leave without my permission. I said, okay, let me have your permission. He did not. And he followed me out. The AKC, the AKC rep was right there. And uh, I saw the AKC rep, and I said, look, this dog will let me show his teeth all day long. The judge is totally safe. This man will not let me show the dog's teeth. And he wants to do it himself. Now, if the AKC wants to sign off all responsibility for me, for the dog, for the owner, sure, let him look in the mouth. But you might as well call an ambulance. At least get him on the way. You know, because this guy's going to get... So the rep says to this guy, what are you, stupid? He says, if Jeff tells you he needs to show you the teeth, he needs to show you the teeth. <laughs> so the guy says, okay, you can bring him back in. I said, no, no, we've already done this. I, he's back in the van. I'm not going to go in there and have him say, well, he had a, a extra two a extra hairs on his ass, so I couldn't put him up. And it wasn't going to happen. But it was just one of the, the funny things that, that happened at the dog shows. And you encounter them a lot. Uh, I think that judges would have a lot of problems, particularly in bigger classes, if it were not for professional handlers. Oh, I'm sure, yes. The professional handlers keep the dogs the dogs moving most of the time. Uh, and they, they keep things a little more organized. Uh, and another thing, for those out there that are watching that are not judges or been in it for a long time, forget about this politics end of it. Sure, if there's more than one person involved, there's politics. You probably see more male judges putting up females and more female judges putting up males. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these judges want to go. They study hard for it, most of them. Uh, most of them look at it as a lifelong activity, which it is. And most of them want to get out of that building doing a job that everybody liked. That's basically what they want. They're no different than you and me. They're just people. But when they put up some dog in the ring, generally it's like Republicans and Democrats. There are the group that like the dog and the group that think the dog's awful. And probably the dog falls someplace in between those two things. But uh, they always want to try and crucify the judge. Oh, he didn't look at movement. Or he didn't look at head. Or he didn't look at top lines. And believe it or not, those are all the things that are good on their dogs. 
So that means he didn't look at the best part of my dog. My dog sleeps on the bed and loves the kids, so it's got to be a good dog. But um, it, this, I think it really hurts a lot of people. Uh, it has a lot of good people go out of dogs because they think that there's hard politics going on. Right. And very few of the very few of the good judges want to go in there and put up another dog, even if it's their friend's dog, over a better dog, because they know all the handlers in the ring are going to know they did that. And then they won't bring them their best dog, because why should you? Maybe he's got a better friend. But I don't care if it's attorneys or doctors or whatever it is. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. I like to think there's many more of the good. Uh, I've done a lot of judges' education for Dane Club, Dublin Club, and Rottweiler Club. And uh, I find most people are enthusiastic that they want they want to do a good job. Uh, in fact, I made a mistake the other day, one of the few. Uh, a judge asked me how they did that day, and they had been to my judge's education. And I said, you did the best you could with what you know. He took a he step back like, what? I said, oh, wait a minute. No one can do any better than what they know. <laughs> I mean, no. But but he thought up for some reason I was insulting him. No, yeah. but I'll never, I'll never use that again because he, <laughs> uh, you know, he was taken aback. Uh, but it, I think that it, it gets a lot of people out because of what I call the venom group. These are the people that have never won anything and never will, but they know how to tell everybody else how to do it. And they generally poison the people uh, against what's happening in the ring. Uh, you know, you get some dog that wins a whole bunch of breeds, and obviously it's political. You know, it's not. It's because it's the best dog. Now, if you put the best dog with a really good handler, it becomes a very difficult situation to beat. That's and right. it should be. And it should be. You know, it, you don't put up the dog. You don't put up the dog just because a certain handler has it. You don't put the dog down because a certain handler has it. Uh, and a lot of the people also that have a title of um, novice have been novice for four or five years. You know, it, <laughs> whenever they don't win, well, you know, they come over the judge. I understand I'm not a professional. I'm not slick. I'm not this. I'm not that. Yeah, you're not a very good handler what the story is. But and when you get to be a better handler, you'll do better. You know, it's funny. That you, you know this for sure. If you're, you know, makes a good handler is knowing which dogs are good. You know, like Maribeth O'Neill, I wanted the, uh, I did the symposium for the AKC. And I said to her, you know, I don't really feel qualified. And she said, you know who else told me that? Frank Sabella and Andy Rogers Clark. You know, not that I'm in that grouping, but um, it was, it was interesting that, that we all said that. And then she came walking by later. I did Doberman's Danes and Rottweilers there. And uh, I said, I just had someone in the last group that you need to look at because they are really, really good and dedicated. And she said, oh, well, what makes them so good? I said, the fellow told me afterward that the thing he learned from me was that he wasn't ready to judge Doberman's yet. I said, now this is somebody you need to watch. Because right. if he's the bar that high for himself, He'll be a better judge. And again, in judging, um, I think any of the judges that have a mental picture of ideal, whatever breed it is they're judging, the closest one to that wins. Now, you have to have a point of reference. So pick out some dog to be your mental ideal, whatever it is. And then as you go along, you'll make changes to it and make changes to it. And you never stop that. If you ever stop that, you might as well stop being involved in dogs because that's what keeps you going. That's when that's why these people out there are 93 years old are still running to the dog show that are judging because there's always something else to learn. When I got off that plane in England, I thought a pointer looked one way. When I got back on, I had a whole different perspective of it. So, you know, it's... Um, it's, an, it's a never-ending thing. When I'm teaching the seminars, I say to people, one of the things that you get in dogs is if you were to ask someone on their deathbed, what did you do in life? And they say, well, I was a billionaire. Okay, so what? Billionaire is nice. 
but it's not significant. Go to the next fellow and say, what have you done? He said, what I've done is I've worked my whole life to make the petals on the rose stronger, to make the plant healthier, to make the scent more vibe. Well, that's somebody that did something. And the people that are dedicated to dogs in some ways are like the people that uh, are monitoring our wildlife because we're monitoring the way that dog looks. Melbourne Downing said to me, the one thing you need to know in judging is what's currently wrong in that breed and give dogs that don't have that problem more consideration. I think he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Most of these breeds go up and down and up and down and different things become significant. And generally those things that become significant are what's currently wrong in the breed. And that makes sense to me. Oh, most definitely. And, and you, you see it. You, you, you watch a class and uh, you watch a big, a big specialty and you can see the problems in that breed. And they're, they're reoccurring in each class. That's the issue at, the, at that point. So, And then exactly. someone like Melbourne is going to try to fix that. On exactly. That day, so. and yeah, on that day. But the thing is that Melbourne will try and fix what he wants to fix and finds, Alva will do the same thing. And multiple judges will then say, okay, and they'll listen to what they say. So it does change it. Mm -hmm. You know about that. Um, but that's, you know, I think without a metal picture of ideal, you know, basically you're depending on 4-H judging. You know, which one goes over and back best? Who has the best top line? What the heads would look like? We're not quite sure. But if you keep doing it, it's just, it's, it's a disease. I mean, you have to go to the dog show. I was off for COVID. Uh, I thought Melissa was going to tie me up outside the house. You know, I'm, I'm going back and forth. What am I going to do? You know, I've got to go here. Let's work with the dog for the hundredth time. <laughs> You'd had nothing to do. So, uh, you know, I can't wait to go to the dog shows. And after doing it for 61 years, that's kind of interesting and wanting to do going back to the shows again um and i had to get back in shape again to good stand you know you don't run around the ring all the time you start sitting on the couch and you start being being tired looking um now one of the other significant stories would be with Dolph fontana wall i'm sure you've heard of it sometime i would think uh he had like 27 best in shows he was one of the few dogs, if not the only one, uh, to have gotten stud dog and top doberman in the same year. Because as you know, if you're campaigning a dog, it's kind of hard to breed it at the same time. Because one thing is a dog may, you know, just go crazy when he does it. And the other thing is you don't have the time. Uh, so he wasn't bred much, but produced the most champions. He won the breed at the garden, went second in the group. Because the woman that was doing the breed always thought that he needed to be heavier. So I made him heavier for the breed. She gave me the breed. She had beaten him twice before. And then I went to the group under Henry Stecker, who had never put a living dog over him. He gave him a second the group. And he said to me after me, why did you bring him to me so fat? <laughs> and I thought, you know, he wouldn't have been to you if I didn't make him fat. <laughs> but you never know. And he used to go... Uh, I imagine uh, it's too late for the AKC to say anything about this now. But um, whenever I'd fly with Dolph, his best friend was a Himalayan cat. And the Himalayan cat would travel all over with him. And he had a Bob McKee cage, which uh, Bob McKee would made cages out of California and he also yep. made airline I mean, uh, uh, plane parts. But anyway, he uh, would always be calm with the cat. I flew him one time without the cat. He got out, he'd frothing around his mouth. He'd been sweating, you know, he was just, he was a wreck. So he was with me all the time, including when I showed him at the garden. <laughs> <laughs> so he was on the back of the cage of the garden. Wow. <laughs> I, I could just see somebody walking up and looking at the cage and saying, says government there. It's just kind of a strange Doberman head on it, isn't it? <laughs> so those are the stories i wanted to hear those are good <laughs> another one uh would be with the great dane bitch i had called front page news a harlequin bitch and uh, she won the national and won the top 20 and everything and when they were doing the dinner at the top 20 uh they called us up to the stage and i said you know what 
we didn't win the top 20, the dog did. I didn't say that to everybody. I just went and got the dog and brought the dog up on stage with us. And uh, then when we went back to the table, and I'm sure they would frown on that today, but I just had her sit next to me and have the waiter cut up a steak. Yeah. No, she deserved it, but it was a, it was an interesting time. Uh, I, could, I don't know about what else. My wife and I, Melissa, have been breeding Dobermans now for about 20 years. And she is the medical side of it and the nutritional side of it and the paperwork side of it. And basically, I sleep all day. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, only time, the only time I arrive is when it's time to take the picture. Up until then, I do nothing. <laughs> I just drove 11 hours straight from... Uh, from Tennessee, almost a Virginia border, back to Florida. And uh, I left there at 4 o'clock and arrived here at 3.15, something like that. Yeah, yuck. <laughs> yeah, I drove, drove the whole way by myself, just listening to my books on tape or listening to talk radio or something like that. Yeah. But it's just, it just, just doesn't seem to matter. I don't mind driving. My other diesel van, which I use sometime, has got the one I brought up to Canada that you saw, has 526,000 miles on it. Wow. And I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it in two weeks to eleven shows. <laughs> they last forever, those diesel ones. Yeah, they do. Uh, other things. Well, I've said I've judged a lot of top twenties. I've enjoyed that. Um, some of the dogs were very surprising to me that uh, they finished, and um, there should be a statue built to whoever finished them. And the AKC, the AKC <laughs> look to look into put them up. <laughs> oh, Jeff! You know, I always wonder what what happens when a dog is disqualified on the fourth day of a show, and the judge was the dog was shown the other three days. Does the AKC AKC ever consider that yeah, a dog exactly, had yeah. disqualification? all those times <laughs> and made it to the fourth day. So uh, that always makes me wonder, did you look at that? I was at a show and this little old lady had particularly good dogs and she gave me like winner's dog from Major and Rottweilers and best of breed at Dobermans. And, then, and afterward, the AKC rep comes up to me and said, would you mind spending uh, a few minutes with her uh, talk to, talking to her about procedure and things like that because she was opening the Rottweiler's heads and sticking her head in it. I, and I, you know, I, I just can't imagine. She's going to lose her face. She'll be in the retirement community with a big scar. The, so anyway, I said to them, you want me to sit down with this woman for 20 minutes, half hour, something like that? I said, I'll be glad to do it, but I won't have much impact on her in 15, 20 minutes. I said, what you need to ask yourself is who mentored her and what AKC rep thought she was ready. Right. I said, no, what am I going to do? The woman's putting, putting me up all day long, and now what am I supposed to start telling her the things she was doing wrong, which was next to everything? <laughs> you know, she, she lost her place in line when she was going to examination. Uh, <laughs> testicles were examined now and then. But anyway, she tried hard, uh, and I and hopefully somebody spent more than a half hour with her after that. Yeah. I've never seen her again, so I don't know. That may have been her swan song, but it was kind of interesting. Um, I think that some of the there needs to be somehow. Uh, I wouldn't be bad at this, really. Uh, to be kind of an ombudsman that could go around the dog show and not be the AKC rep, not be the policeman, but just to be an observer. I mean, all the way through the experience, maybe see what the pe people are having as far as problems in the hotel. See what's happening as far as RV parking is concerned. See if the judge is doing properly in the ring? And if not, why? Is it because, is he late because of the fact that the ring steward didn't show up till five minutes before you do in the ring? There's a line of people waiting for their numbers. You know, it, there's a lot of things that I think just slip through the cracks that somebody should be looking out for. And not with a, uh, not with anything other than uh, creative criticisms, you know, saying, look, this will work better for you. 
not that we're taking you in front of a committee to to downgrade you. It's enough that they're donating their time and their money to an effort that I love. Sure. I like all of I like all of those people. Anybody who gives me food and affection works well with me. Uh, but there needs to be somebody with an overview of these things. Um, we were at a big show recently where Danes were listed at eight o'clock in the morning. And let's say ring eight. I don't remember what ring it was. When you got there at eight o'clock, there was a sign that said Danes will now be judged at 1.30 and ring 12. So these people, I had to drive an hour and a half to dog show. I left my house at five to make sure I was there at eight promptly or seven. I had to be there at least. Um, we're moving to ring 12, let's say. The judge in ring 12 is a little bit late and rushing over to the new ring we have. This is now the third ring. Okay. It's a three ring circus. <laughs> and, you know, and the woman runs over there to start judging. The woman judging in that ring is almost 40 minutes long. You know, she's late. I said, wow, are they ever going to do things today? But if there was somebody... The AKC rep can't be every place. The right. show chairman can't be every place. But somebody that could walk around and, and look at this thing and make it better. Make it better for everybody. Yeah. Make it better for the... You know, I see some dog shows where the people are running around in the mud. Well, those dogs don't look the same as they do when they're not running around in the mud. Uh, I see sometimes that they have dogs... I went out to California, and they had... This, uh, that's another story. They had this big specialty show, no tanning. Uh, the only tanning was a little tanning for the judges and whatnot. And at that time, the handlers, some of the less ethical handlers, were charging a handling fee when their assistant went in in the same class with them. And they were complaining to the president of PHA, which at that time was Brumby, before he became in charge of the uh, handlers for the AKC. And uh, I didn't like the way it looked. I mean, I had somebody with an umbrella standing next to me. Uh, and the AKC rep at that time came up and said to me, uh, is your name Brucker? I said, no, my name is either Jeff Bruck, uh, Mr. Brucker or Jeff. So we're already starting on a good a good place. And he says, you know, you have two dogs entered in this class. I said, you know, I don't have any dogs entered in this class. He says, well, you're down as handler. I said, I could put you down as handler. I said, I can't control that. Who puts who down as handler? Look at the entry form. I didn't sign either one of them. So he said, well, you have two dogs in this class. And you're trying to charge two handling fees. I said, okay, you see the one I have here. Can you point out the other one? Goes through all the numbers. Says, oh, the other one's absent. I said, no, I, I have one dog in this class, right? That's okay with you. Wow. And he said, oh, he says, yes. He says, uh, I'm sorry. He says, you're clear. You're okay. I'm saying, I'm clear. I'm okay. Thank you. Do you have a moment? She said, yes. I said, you know, uh, the Humane Society could close this place down in five minutes with no place for shade for these dogs. The other things are the garbage cans are overflowing, and I see no place outside the washrooms to wash your hands. I said, there would be a good thing for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw them again. Uh, but it, it's the AKC reps, too. That's a good situation uh, to a good extent. Um, but I think that they need to know more possibly about the breed that they're sitting in judgment of the person judging it. I can understand procedure, but it goes past procedure, as you know. You know, it goes past procedure to um, the judges being influenced to some extent by the AKC rep. You know, like, why did you put number uh, one instead of number three first? I'd like to know who's asking me. Are mm -hmm. you a breed authority? You're not a breed authority? Were you trained by a breed authority? Who, who was that? Uh, and I think that it's, again, that needs to be looked at a little bit. They're good people. Most of them are ex-handlers. Almost all the superintendents are or were ex-handlers. Um, 
But the AKC is rep is necessary at the show. Otherwise, I think it could get a little bit rough. I don't think necessarily the dogs would bite the people, but the people may bite the people. Exactly. So uh, I think the AKC rep is a good thing. Did I just hear, by the way, in Canada that you can no longer uh, have a slang expression for Bush? It's illegal. For what? Did you read about that? For, uh, not for Bush, for uh, Biden. That they were calling Biden some other name. You didn't hear about this either? No. I was listening to, in the barbershop today. They were talking about it, that there's some slang name for Biden. And in Canada, they made it illegal to do that, to say that. <laughs> I, I said, haven't heard that yet. So, so freedom of speech is totally gone. Then, huh? <laughs> no. I, I have one. I have one last question for you, Jeffrey. Oh no, it's almost over. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> You're gonna miss Jeopardy. <laughs> but somebody else has been talking to you. You didn't remember that, did you? Oh, no, I remember okay. that. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you could meet the 20 year old Jeffrey now. What advice would you give him? Oh, not much. I can tell you that. Uh, to learn as much from people as you possibly can, to not be dogmatic about your thinking, to be open-minded. Um, go to the people that are successful. Don't try and learn from the people that don't know how to do it. And they're the ones generally that are the most verbal. Uh, other than that, don't go through that period where you were wearing leisure suits. Uh, you're not Elvis <laughs> Presley, so don't let your sideburns get that long. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're going to have a mustache when you get older. Uh, but right now, it's not significant. By the way, I have to add one thing. Okay. Do you have, do you have time? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Larry Downey. Did you know who Larry Downey was? Yeah, I knew who he was. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, he trained Stan Flowers and whatnot. He was at a show I was at, and he was like, you know, Babe Ruth to me. The the guy won. He won everything, uh, and he was very good about what he was doing, and. Uh, I was talking to some people and a judge and another handler and a couple of breeders. And he said, when you get finished, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Well, this is Babe Ruth telling a rookie he wants to talk to him for a minute. So after it was done, which I made go very fast because I wanted to go talk to Larry Downey, I went in the trailer with him and he and Alice were in there. And uh, he said, you can take this as you wish, but. He said, you've got very good hands to dogs like you. Today, I watched you, and the judge that judged today was wrong in the decision he made. And afterward, he was in that group we were talking about. You made your point. Everybody knew you were right, including him. But you drove him into the ground. He said, now he's got five friends, and their judges, and those five friends have judges. He says, and you've dug yourself a hole there. He said, the other thing is, I hear you talking a lot. He said, why don't you listen? He says, you already know everything you're going to say. And I said, what good life lessons those yeah. are. Yeah. Now, other people might have taken offense to that. But I took them as life lessons. And I listen a lot better now. And I don't drive anybody into the ground because I realize that they're doing the best they can with what they know. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> anyway, it's been fun. That was great, Jeffrey. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I hope it was all right for you. No, it was, uh, it was perfect. The, uh, you said you're talking to Wayne Ferguson? No, Wayne Cavanaugh. Wayne Cavanaugh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah. Sounds good. You can say hello for me there too. I will. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, Jeff. It was great to catch up to you. Uh, if you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you need to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. If you want to just see what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. And don't forget about the Dog Show Drive every Thursday, the podcast with Wayne Kavanaugh and myself. Until next week. <laughs>